So the first speaker is Alexander Madri from MIT. He will speak about gradients and flows. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander Madre. And yeah, as advertised, I will talk today about gradients and flows, namely how to approach some of the classic questions in uh, graph algorithms known as max flow. But kind of there will be also a broader message of like a recent uh, approach to trying to do algorithms differently. Okay, so let me, ex I will explain it as we go. Okay, so the point of start here is just saying that algorithms is really a great success story, okay? So by now we have like 50 plus years of work on this uh, subject and, you know, over time we had all these beautiful algorithms that somehow ended up being kind of the uh, backbone of what we think as computer science nowadays and also like from theory point of view we had really like a lot of beautiful ideas that somehow allow us to think about these complex uh, objects in a very nice way. Okay, so you know, by now we have all of this understanding. If you take uh, algorithms, undergrad algorithms class, you will learn a lot of beautiful stuff. So you know, this is all great, but you know, the question I want to ask today is, you know, even though all of this is great, is it really the case that we are doing the algorithms the right way? Okay, so what do I mean by that? So somehow my continuous gripe with the way we do algorithms currently, and I do algorithms myself, is that I still view it too much of an art, okay? So what do I mean by here? The, this is that, well, let's look at the typical algorithm production cycle, okay? So whenever you want to solve a problem, you start by, well, formally defining what is the algorithm problem you want to solve. Once you define it, then you start working hard to understand the structure of this problem and exactly what, you know, essentially how this definition, you know, what kind of structure does it impose over the objects you want to understand. And then after like working hard, you finally realize something and you can turn this understanding into an actual nice algorithm. Okay, so that's how we do algorithms currently, and you know, and there is many good things to be said about the, this kind of way of doing algorithms because you know, if you are an algorithm aficionado as uh, as I am, you really enjoy each step of this process. Okay, that's essentially what we, if you're a mathematician, that's what you enjoy. But somehow, if you think about it from a bit broader perspective, you might not be not so mu so much happy about this because you know, one undesirable effect here will be that essentially the algorithms done this way, they tend to be very non-robust to the change in definition. So if you change your problem slightly, you change the definition slightly, often uh, times, you know, your technique will not work anymore and you have to start over right away. On the other hand, you know, also if you are really like just very driven by the definitions that you are trying to pursue, the problem is that kind of you end up with a very fragmented understanding of the landscape of algorithms. So we have like a lot of this kind of sub-communities that work on a very specific problem and often rediscover the same ideas independently without even realizing that. Okay, so somehow, you know, so this is how we do things and the question is, you know, how could we do them differently? So maybe, you know, so maybe, you know, this undesirable effect will be minimized and somehow, yeah, so somehow the goal could be to develop a more unified and principled view on algorithms and of course I would not say that we should do it without having a concrete proposition and concrete proposal here is to actually make continuous optimization the language of algorithms, okay? So somehow, what I really would like the algorithm, doing algorithms look like is just to follow the following meta-algorithm. So what you do is start by formulating your problem as a continuous optimization task, let's say as a linear program or as a, some, some minimization of some function over some domain. And then once you formulate that, the problem like this, what you do is just you don't have to figure out everything from scratch. What you do instead, you look at, you know, some, you just apply some on off the shelf of the algorithm uh, to the problem. Essentially, continuous optimization has uh, many standard tools for solving you know, linear programs or solving uh, continuous minimiza uh, like minimization of continuous functions, and you just like, take one of these algorithms and apply it to your problem. Okay? And what is nice here is that already at this stage, we already have a working algorithm. Of course, usually this will not be the most efficient algorithm that you could imagine, so there is some work needed to refine it, and probably then you need some like, problem-specific insights. But in the end, you know, starting from an algorithm that already works and just making it a little bit better is easier than just starting from a scratch. So somehow, in a sense, you can see that the first two points are great for practitioners. If you just want to get an algorithm quickly, you can get it without much thinking. And then there is a part for like, people who enjoy thinking about difficult problems and kind of you know, uh, tweaking the algorithms, and that's the last part here. Okay, so, so this is nice about this meta-algorithm that it's kind, of quite, you know, it's kind of quite automatic. And also the bonus here is that it's not only that actually there are like many of the off-the-shelf algorithms. Actually what turns out that there really is just only one algorithm that matters. Okay, so there's essentially like everything in continuous optimization you solve using gradient descent. Just there are different forms of gradient descent, but always the principle is the same. 
So there's like this great unifying effect like that, and you know, and this kind of should improve our understanding and kind of like uniform view of the field. So. And what I will do today, so this is kind of the broader picture I was trying to advertise here, and to advertise it, I actually want to illustrate to you how this uh, scenario played out in the context of a specific problem, namely the maximum flow problem. Okay, and that's what we will do today, uh, somehow, just to show you how this kind of different perspective can lead to new and better algorithms. Okay, so you know, before I talk about you know how we apply this continuous optimization methodology, let's talk about the workhorse, workhorse of all of this, namely the grand descent method. Okay, so Grandison method is essentially an algorithm that is designed to solve one type of task, namely, you know, uh, <coughs> unconstrained minimization problem, in which we have some convex and, let's say, continuous for now function, and we just want to find it minimum. Okay, and, you know, uh, so, so this is the problem, and the way you do it is essentially the most obvious way you would think about it. Essentially, what you do, you just try to do, apply a continuous greedy strategy. So you want to start with some, you know, uh, you st we want to start with some p initial point x0, and then find a way to get a new, like a better point, you know, x1, then x2, x3, so that each prob each new point improves upon the previous point, and hopefully over time you will make enough progress to get a nearly optimal solution. Okay, so somehow the core primitive here would be just to have this, you know, uh, f uh, have this, you know, procedure that given x finds a displacement delta, like uh, finds a direction in which to move to make the function be even smaller than currently. And clearly, like after it you iterate it uh, many enough times, you will get to the point where you get, you know, close to uh, uh, close to optimal solution. Okay, so now how do you figure out, you know, what is the right direction to pursue to, in the order to minimize function? Well, somehow, what really you have to do, you just have to, uh, you know, uh, you have to resort, your, uh, resort to this, like, what I call the key principle of continuous optimization. And what it says is that, you know, no matter how complicated your function is, if you zoom in at this function close enough, like, you know, uh, like if you, if you uh, zoom in close enough to your current point, Essentially, you can think of it as a very simple function. Okay, you can think of this as a linear function. So, specifically, of course, we all know what I really mean here. So, if you look at Taylor expansion, okay, of this of this function around the given point x, well, the right way to think about this, like to look at this uh, this Taylor expansion, is just to view it as a sum of two parts. So, there is the first part, which essentially is just a linear approximation of the function around the point. So, you can just this is essentially like how you want to view this function. You want to view it as a linear function locally. And then there is kind of this error part that corresponds to exactly like how much f like how much nonlinear your function really is, and kind of this is this is what measures that. And somehow what is nice here already you can see that somehow the this like the change in the value due to like you know predicted by the linear approximation is linear in the length of the dis displacement, uh, while the term well usually at least for nice function it's quadratic or even you know a higher power of the order. So clearly there is always small enough displacement that our gain from our that our linear approximation gaze is not outweighed by the error that we actually are introducing. Okay, and somehow you know one way to make it uh, to make it precise is essentially like if you want to con uh, if you want to control this kind of this tail, we just as we just want to assume that the function is beta smooth, which means I can always upper bound this error by a quadratic with some particular you know uh, with some particular coefficient in front of it. So somehow the geometric picture is uh, like that. That's essentially whenever we're at a, at a point x, we think of it as a linear function. And then, you know, that gives us also the lower bound on, the f on this function everywhere. And then there is this, like, if we add to this linear function our quadratic coming from beta smoothness, we have a global upper bound on our function. Okay? And now, all we have to do if we want to figure out what is the direction to that ensures that we make progress, essentially we try to, if we forget about our original function, we just try to minimize this local upper bound, because it's a global upper bound. And if you work out, you know, this is now a simple quadratic function, and if you figure, if you figure out what is the displacement that minimizes this, uh, this local uh, upper bound, you will get something that is essentially that you should move in the steepest di decrease direction, so essentially you should move in the direction that is like uh, the minus gradient direction. So the, the, the gradient tells you locally uh, like direction that you increase the most, and you go, of course, you want to decrease, so you go the opposite of that. Okay, so essentially, this is like the sense in which this is a greedy algorithm. And of course, now you would ask yourself, okay, so you know, how many iterations do I need to make until I actually get to an epsilon optimal solution? And you can work it out, and you know, this is one of the standard bounds that you get, which really depends on the smoothness parameter. So essentially, like the smoother you are, the faster you converge, and on the initial distance from the optimal point, okay, essentially, how far you have to go.
Okay? But this one's called in the generality. The only thing you need is just this beta smoothness and convexity of the function. Great. And what is really amazing is that essentially what I told you now is almost everything you need to know to use continuous optimization. Of course, to get this kind of last drop, to really like get very, very final goods, you have to know more. But this is really the, like everything can be derived from just what I told you uh, here. You just have to get, uh, use the right definitions and you just think about you know more complex, like more more sophisticated ways of employing it. Okay, so this is the gradient descent. So this will be the hammer that we will be using. So let's talk now about the problem that we want to solve here. And the problem is maximum flow problem. So you may, maybe some of you have seen this problem already. Maybe some of you don't. So let me go quickly about, uh, uh, over the definition. So when you talk about the maximum flow problem, we think of a directed graph G that has capacities on each arc. So this is a directed graph. And we have capacities on, on each arc, which are positive numbers. And we have two special vertices, source S and sink T. And now our goal is to find an, a feasible ST flow in this graph of maximum value. So what does a being a feasible ST flow uh, mean? Well, it means that on one hand, so we want to find assignments of numbers to the edges that satisfies two types of constraints. So on one hand, we have the flow conservation constraints. So for every vertex other than S and T, the flow coming into the vertex should be equal to the flow going out of the vertex. So there should be no leaks. And the other type of constraint is that we should never flow through the arc more than the capacity. Okay, so you should not overflow any of the arcs. So any assignment of numbers that, as, uh, that satisfies this two co type of constraints is called the feasible ST flow. And now what you want to maximize, well, you want to maximize the value of the flow, which essentially is the net flow out of S, which you can easily see by flow conservation is the total net flow into T. So you just essentially want to maximize the number of stuff that we send from S to T. And you know, in particular, here, the value, of the, you know, the value of the flow that we see is seven. But if you think about the maximum value that is attainable, you know, it's actually 10. And and here is an example of a flow that attains this value. Okay? And you know, in the case when all the capacities would be exactly one, then essentially the problem that you are trying to solve here is just try to find the number, the maximum number of at disjoint paths between S and T that you can pack into this graph. Okay, that's the problem you are solving here. Okay? So this is the problem. Well, why, why do we care about this problem? Well, the short answer is because this is actually one of the most fundamental questions in, you know, in graph algorithms. And re there are the reasons for that is twofold. So first of all, this problem actually tends out to abstract away a quite a lot of real-world optimization problems. But also, from the other point of view, it's actually one of the, pro of the problems that seems to be the most fertile ground for discovering new algorithmic ideas. So things like primal dual algorithms essentially stemmed from our study of max flow. And there's many other techniques that essentially came up first in the context of maximum flow. So if you want to discover new tools for graph algorithms or the gra algorithms in general, you might want to use that maximum flow. Okay, and that's what people do. There's now like a thick book about just different versions of the maximum flow problem and different algorithms for it. Okay, so this is the problem. Now the question is, what is known about the problem so far? So I will just, clearly this is like a super well-studied problem, so I cannot give you overview of everything that happened. I will just give you a very brief overview that focuses on one particular regime of maximum flow problem, namely one in which we think of graphs being sparse. Essentially, so the number of edges uh, in, the, in the graph, number of arcs, is not much larger than the number of, vert uh, of vertices. And the reason why this is an interesting benchmark is actually this is the benchmark where all these traditional methods kind of like where, you know, we're making progress first. So usually first we make progress in this regime and only later on we extend it to kind of the general case when things are not sparse. So this is really like kind of the critical direction for our progress on the work on max flow. And now, if you think about this, you know, if you think about this uh, regime, then essentially you can divide the work on this problem into two eras, okay? So the first era is the classical era. Essentially, this is, if you have taken, you know, uh, algorithms class, these are the, you know, the augmenting path algorithms that you have s for sure studied in the class. Okay? So, and, you know, the, uh, well, the key result here is the result of Ivan and Tajan and also independently of Karzanov, which shows that if you ask, you know, if you want to, like, if your capacities are, are all unit capacities, so if you only have unit capacities and you want to find the maximum flow in your graph, you need to spend time that is roughly, you know, n to the three halves. Okay? So this is n is number of vertices, again. Now, uh, this, was, this happened in the 70s. It took quite a while to the work of Goldberg and Rao to get a similar running time for the general case, for the case when the capacities are not, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, uniform. And, you know, and, that's, uh, and, and, then, you know, and that's kind of was the state of the art for this kind of classical algorithms. 
As you can clearly see from this line of work, essentially like in the 70s, we knew how to solve this problem in M2D3 half time. And over the years, we did not really make much progress here. So somehow there is this kind of bar barrier of N2D3 halves that we just couldn't make, you know, like we just couldn't push through. And essentially like this inability of the classic methods to kind of to go further than that was somehow which you know motivated this kind of the switch of methodology so which we now call the modern era modern era and somehow this modern era the algorithms and you will see them in a moment essentially they are very different so what they do they rely on linear algebra and on continuous optimization to compute this uh, this you know this maximum flow Okay, so somehow, first, this progress was actually done in the like, relaxed context of the problem. So it's like, before we started working on kind of trying to solve the maximum flow, as I said on the previous slide, we will first look at the easier version of the problem. Namely, we look at this problem in the undirected graphs, and we only were looking for ap approximate answers as opposed to exact answers. Even for that, this barrier of n to the three halves was not, you know, we didn't know how to, you know, how to improve over it, and essentially, you know, but yeah, once we started doing that, when we started thinking about this, essentially oh, there, was, there is this whole uh, line of work that essentially managed to get us an algorithm that is nearly linear. So essentially its running time is you know, linear in number of vertices and depends only like you know, one over epsilon on this error, kind of, of the, on this one plus epsilon approximation that you, want to, that you want to get. So essentially this is, uh, well, in some ways the best possible and somehow in this domain, like in this regime of undirected and approximate uh, max flow, we really got you know, kind of full progress. We, were like, we essentially can be very happy with ourselves. We essentially got near optimal algorithm. Okay, so that's what happened once we switched this, you know, uh, this methodology. But of course, this is still a relaxed setting. You know, how about the actual, you know, exact directed and indirected regime? Well, it turns out that then you can actually move this. You know, like you can imp like you can transplant some of this understanding that we built in the context of undirected uh, max flow to directed max flow as well. And we also were finally able to improve upon this n to the three halves bound. Although we are able to do it essentially for like small capacities. So essentially, like you can think of just unit capacity regime. We still, for general capacities, we still don't know how to, you know, how to improve it further. Okay. So this is essentially the timeline. This is essentially the progress that happened over the last, uh, you know, eight years or so. And what I want to tell you about today is essentially I want to tell you like some of the ideas behind this progress and somehow how gradient descent as an algorithm comes up naturally. As the right way to, as the right thing to apply, once you think about maximum flow problem not as a combinatorial problem, but as an actual continuous optimization problem. Okay, so let's just try to do that. Okay, so essentially, as I mentioned, you know, the combinatorial approaches were based on this, some kind of al argumenting path framework. And now, what I want to tell you is about is how would you solve max flow if you didn't want to go through that route? Like you would really want to apply continuous optimization to this problem. Okay, and for now we will talk about undirected variant and this approximate variant, and then we will go back to this, you know, the kind of the classic setting of max flow in directed graphs and exact. Okay, so yeah, so how would you approach solving maximum flow problem if I told you that you are supposed to use continuous optimization? Well, the first thing that we, we remember the meta algorithm, yes, like the first step was to phrase your problem that you want to solve as a continuous optimization question. So to this end, well, the language of continuous optimization is linear algebra. So first you have to think, like to, to do that, you have to think, start by thinking about the flow, not as a kind of collection of paths, collection of flow paths, but you have to think about it as a linear algebraic object, namely a vector. This is not hard to do. There is you know, some natural encoding in which you can kind of think of flows as vectors. You can, for instance, think that there is, you have like an m-dimensional uh, space. So you have a, one coordinate for each of the edges. And then the kind of the absolute value of the number of this coordinate tells you how much you are flowing over the edge. And then the sign of this coordinate tells you in which direction you flow it. So clearly, every flow can be, you know, can be encoded as a vector, and every vector corresponds to some flow. It might not be an ST flow, but it will be a flow nonetheless. So that's the first step. Now, the question is, how can we phrase a max flow as an optimization process in which you optimize over this vector encoding of the flow? So to this end, one convenient thing to do here is just instead of thinking of just computing the maximum flow straight up, what you do, you just want to, to just solve this f the following decision question. You just want to say, OK, I have some guess for the value of maximum flow gamma. And all I want to do is I want to figure out if there actually like, there exists a flow of, you know, of, of value at least gamma or not. 
clearly, once you have such an oracle that gives you such an answers, you can apply binary search to get the maximum flow problem. So really, this is, you know, this is the problem that we really need to solve here. OK, so how would we solve this problem? Well, here is maybe not the most obvious way to do it, but actually, this will be the most convenient way to do it. So essentially, what you are saying is just you are saying the following. So I want to minimize this objective function, and I will explain what this objective function is in a moment, subject to the constraint that none of the entries of my vector, so none of the, of the flows on any of the edges, is more than one. So we are talking about the unit capacity flow here, by the way. OK, so essentially, so by the way, saying that every entry of the, you know, of the vector is at most one just means that we just want to bound the L infinity norm of this vector to be at most one. And somehow, uh, and essentially what the objective tells us is essentially what we are measuring is for a given vector, we measure the distance between this vector and its projection on the space of all the ST flows of value gamma. OK, so in particular, if F is a valid uh, ST flow of value gamma, then this objective will be zero because essentially the projection will be just identity. Okay, so we are just saying, okay, you should always flow at most one unit of flow on, on every edge, and then you know we want you to be as close as possible to some uh, you know ST flow of value gamma. Clearly, if there is a solution that actually flows a value of gamma and you know and does not overflow any kind of capacities, the value will be zero, and that's the you know the minimum value of the program. And essentially, like clearly, you will be by just being able to say if the optimum value is zero or not, you are able to solve the decision problem that you are trying to solve here. Okay, so that's you know so that so that's the uh, that's the way to write it analytically. Geometrically, what's really happening here is just you can think of like if you think about it, the space of ST flows of value gamma is really an affine subspace. You can just specify it by just specifying some uh, linear, uh, uh, linear equalities. The vector should, should, should satisfy some number of linear equalities. And then what you are asking, essentially, you have this unit, uh, unit box around the origin, and you are trying to find the closest point in this, in this box like that is the closest to its affine subspace describing you know, the ST flows of value gamma. So essentially, that's the geometric problem that you are really solving here. Okay? So let's try to solve it now. So this is the problem we want to solve. And now the question is, well, how do we go about solving this problem? So you know, we now just executed the first step of the meta-algorithm. We phrase our question as a, a continuous optimization question. Now is the, uh, the second phase. We actually have to come up with an algorithm for it. But you know, the nice thing about the meta-algorithm was that this algorithm is always an obvious one. Like, there is some off-the-shelf algorithm. And essentially, and as I told you already, in continuous optimization, there's always only one answer. If you ask yourself, what is the algorithm that I will use, it's just, I just will just use gradient descent. OK, so what does gradient descent really, de like, what does it really mean to apply gradient descent to this setting? So what we will do is just start with some initial, you know, guess for the flow f. It might be just an all, all zero flow. And now what we will do, we'll try to improve this answer. OK, so we start with some answer. It might not be great, so we try to improve it. How do we improve it? It's essentially, well, we know. We just execute a gradient step. So what we do is just we compute the gradient of our objective. So this is our objective. We compute this gradient. And then you know, we move a bit in the minus gradient direction. And you can show that smoothness here is, is beta s1. So essentially, you really just, just you know, can uh, subtract the gradient from your current point, And that will be the new, new point f prime. Of course, you know, this new point f prime, it will improve your objective. The problem, though, is that it might this, you know, this move might take you outside of this box. So that will not be a solution that is in the box. It will not be a feasible solution. So you have to fix it somehow. And the way you fix it is, again, the most natural thing you could do, what you just do, you just project back this new point f prime onto the, onto the cube. So essentially, you are finding the closest point on the cube to this point f prime that you just found. OK, so now you have a new point that hopefully is a bit better than the previous point, And you just keep iterating this you know, until you are happy with the solution. OK? And well, that's it. I just described to you a max flow algorithm. And you know, I didn't even have to mention a word graph here. OK, so this is like everything was like very natural. Everything was very simple. And this is actually a working algorithm here. Well, there is one catch that I kind of s sort of like uh, hid under the rug. Is I did not tell you how actually I compute the gradient. And you know, this is where the graph sort of is coming back, like the structure of the graph is coming back uh, again, because you know, computing this gradient corresponds to computing this projection, uh, you know, p gamma on the space of st flows of value gamma. But if you think about what this corresponds to, well, this corresponds to computing certain electrical flow in your network. So essentially, you have to compute electrical flow in your network. And then what is nice is that once you know this is electrical flow, you know that this really corresponds to solving a linear system. 
Okay, and actually, this is a very special system called the Laplacian system. And we know there is a beautiful work of Spielman and Tang and a lot of beautiful follow-up work that shows that if you, like, if you need to compute the Dirichlet flow all, you know, equivalently to solve a Laplacian linear system, then essentially you can do it extremely efficiently, namely in nonlinear linear time. So this is essentially the only non-trivial uh, step of this algorithm is computing this gradient, and it boils down to solving a Laplacian system that we know how to do extremely efficiently. Okay, but now there is nothing like that. That's all that there is. You know, you can just you know the only non-trivial part is solving this Laplacian system, and now you have a full and working max flow algorithm. Which again, if you have seen augmenting path-based uh, algorithms, it looks very different than what I just told you. Okay. So that's a wor working algorithm, but the question is, so it will give us a good answer. The question is, what is the running time? Okay. In particular, what is the convergence to like a near optimal solution? And you know, well, we know how to analyze this either. So I just gave you uh, earlier the generic bound for the convergence performance of gradient descent. So you know, the only two quantities that we need to bound here is you know, beta, which I told you is already one, and the distance to the optimum, which you know, is not hard to just bound this distance by, uh, you know, by, uh, way by m, like square root of m, which is O of n. And once you put everything together, you will get an algorithm that runs in time n square over epsilon. Okay? Well, n square over epsilon is not great, to be honest, because we know how to solve the problem exactly in n to the 3 halves time, so which is better. But, you know, like just I want to make two points. First of all, the nice thing about this was that we didn't really have to think about what we are doing. We really took just the off-the-shelf algorithm and just applied it in a most natural way. And the other thing is that this is really just this generic off-the-shelf attempt. You know, once you know what is the problem you want to solve, continuous optimization has a lot of recipes how to get kind of a little bit better variant of gradient descent for your problem. So in particular, if you do some standard massaging that's really like just completely something completely standard from the book, you will immediately improve this algorithm to make the running time to be n to the three halves. Okay, and some power of epsilon. So essentially you can match what we know from like the best that we know from the standard algorithms, you can match it very easily. But of course, the question is, you know, how do you improve over n to the, n to the three halves? Like, can you actually go beyond this n to the three halves barrier? And that's where things start to get interesting. So essentially, you know, if you think about what is the reason that somehow the standard methods give you this n to the three halves uh, running time, why are we getting stuck there? There's actually a very clear geometric intuition behind it. Somehow the phenomena that we are really trying to, like the reason why we essentially are off by a factor of square root of n is that we are having a geometry mismatch. So what is the mismatch? Well, essentially, what we really are trying to do when we solve max flow, we try to minimize the L infinity flow, uh, L infinity norm of the vector because we just care about being within this L infinity box. On the other hand, when we do the projection, we use the L2 geometry and not, not L infinity geometry. Okay, so, uh, and we know that these two geometries can be very different. In particular, in the worst case, the discrepancy is exactly square root of, you know, square root of the dimension. Okay, so somehow, you know, the usual intuition here is that, you know, if I have a box of, you know, of, of some si uh, side length, then, you know, essentially the difference between, you know, the ball, like this, uh, the ball that I can inscribe and the, and the smallest ball in which I can inscribe this box, like the difference in this kind of, the, like if you look at this, you know, at, well, either this point or the corner point, then essentially the difference between the L4 norm and the L2 norm of the vectors can be like as far apart as square root of n. Okay, so that's exactly the, that's, this is exactly the reason why we are getting this square root of m uh, kind of you know, uh, overhead in the running time, because we are trying to solve L infinity uh, geometry problem by L2 geometry problem, and th that's where we pay for it. Okay, so now once you know that, you can think about, okay, so what can we, what can we do here? So one approach that you know, uh, my work with you know, Paul Cristiano, John Kellner, Dan Spielman, and Sheng Guaten proposed was to essentially try to re like not use just straight up L2 geometry to project, but actually try to use a reweighted L2 geometry. So essentially like I, instead of using balls, I'm trying to use ellipses that essentially are reweighted uh, accordingly. And there is some kind of you know, way of adaptively reweighting this geometry so that in the direction that we that matter to us, our reweighted L2 norm looks almost like you know the L infinity norm. Okay, and when you do that, then essentially you will get an improvement. You will be able to break this n to the three halves bound and get an n to the four thirds uh, running time. Okay, so that's what we did. But of course, once I told you uh, uh, like what's really happening here, the really obvious thing to do is something else. So instead of just trying to reweight this L2 norm to make it fit better L infinity norm, you might think of actually you know, using L infinity geometry to project as well. 
Okay, so why don't you why, why to use even L2 if you could use Alfinity? There are some trouble in doing this, but in the end, you can make it work, and this is exactly the ideas behind the work of Sherman and Kellner et al. To, uh, that exactly did it, and essentially what they what they got was a near linear time algorithm. And essentially, you can always uh, uh, we can also uh, like you know you can also refine it. This is cut in the slide. You can also refine it. And essentially, what in the end you know the way you get this kind of close to like near linear algorithm for max flow is exactly by using this kind of L infinity, approximate L infinity projections and kind of the geometric view of the problem. Okay? So again, I don't expect you to fully follow the algorithm, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of what is, at the, like what is the kind of geometric phenomena you have to deal with to essentially go from the kind of this running time of n to the three, ha three halves to this improved, uh, well, close to linear running time. You, just to, you have to find the right geometry to uh, kind of to, uh, well, algorithmically uh, approximate L infinity, uh, L infinity uh, geometry. That is, you know, the native geom geometry of the uh, max volume flow problem. Okay? So this is essentially, you know, very quickly how you get, you know, this, you know, state-of-the-art algorithms for, you know, the undirected max flow problem in, you know, in, uh, well, the maximum flow problem in undirected graphs. But, you know, in the end, we care about the solving the problem exactly and solving it also for directed graphs. So let's talk about that. What, what happens here? So, you know, the natural uh, hope here would be that given all this progress that we made on the undirected version of the problem, you know, you might hope that this will be, there will be an easy way to translate this progress into the uh, directed world. And the good news here is that actually the directed max flow and undirected max flow are not that different as you would think. In particular, you can, like, if you, uh, like, being able to solve undirected max flow problem is enough to also solve the directed version of the problem, except there is a catch. The catch is, so you can reduce directed max flow problem to undirected max flow problem. The catch, though, is that you really have to be able to solve undirected version of the problem very well. Essentially, you, you, you cannot afford to be just one plus epsilon approximate. You really have to solve it exactly. Okay, so that's the catch. So if you were able to solve undirected max flow exactly, you would be done. You could also use it to solve directed max flow as well. But we can't, we can't. And actually this is something quite inherent. Essentially you can show that this like, this schemes based just on direct gradient descent, they actually are inherently unable to give you good enough accuracy to make this detection work. So there is kind of some fundamental, you know, barrier here that you have to overcome to, you know, to get, you know, the results for directed graphs. And so this is the bad news, but you know, the good news is that, as I said, continuous optimization is a field that has a lot of tools. And you know, when you, and of course they really understand about the, uh, these limitations of gradient descent, so it also means that they have also ways of trying to, uh, well, try to circumvent them. So essentially you need a, like this hammer might not work uh, all the way, but then they have a bigger hammer that you can use. And indeed, the bigger hammer here uh, to use is something called interior point methods. So what are the interior point methods? Well, in, in general, these are just general approaches to solving linear programs, okay, or even more general convex programs. And somehow, so let's talk a little bit how they work. So imagine here we have a linear program. So this linear program just, it's no mean, uh, mean C transpose X subject to this inequalities. So any linear program can be cast in this form, like as this kind of uh, formulation. And now, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, why, why is solving this problem difficult? It turns out that the difficult part in this program are these inequalities. Essentially, optimizing over affine subspace, so when you have equalities, is actually very easy. It's just solving a linear system. But optimizing over inequalities is actually very hard. So this is somehow what makes, you know, what makes solving this problem difficult. So how is, you know, how is interior method trying to go around this problem? Well, what it does is something very interesting. So what it does is essentially drops this uh, feasibility constraints, and instead chooses, so it's like essentially it forgets about these inequalities, and what it does, it introduces a barrier term into the objective to somehow enforce this, you know, enforce these constraints implicitly. So we have this kind of, you know, like for every constraint we have this log of, you know, of, uh, well, you know, how much the uh, constraint is violated uh, kind of term, and, and what happens is this term essentially goes to infinity if you well, if you try to uh, like get close to violation of a corresponding of a corresponding constraint. So essentially, like as long as you as this uh, parameter mu here is positive, you are implicitly enforcing all of the feasibility constraints. So that's great. So now you still are getting what you wanted, and you don't have to actually explicitly deal with any inequalities. Of course, there is a price because you know the price is that okay. So the, the other good thing is that you know again, clearly we change the objective. 
So the problem we are solving now is not the problem we wanted to solve. Okay, so this is just some kind of different version of the problem. It's there's this parameter mu, and well, clearly if mu is approaching zero, the optimum solution to this new problem approaches the solution to the original problem we wanted to solve. But you know, the problem is that initially at least, you know, mu is not zero because you know we can only solve this problem easily if mu is large. And then somehow we have to go from the solution for LP mu for large value to mu, uh, of mu to the solution for LP mu for very small value of mu. And that's exactly what interior method is trying to do. So how is it doing that? Well, essentially, you know, uh, what you do is something called like, you know, path following routine, which is like a very simple greedy approach again. So what you do is just, okay, you assume you have an optimal solution to this problem LP mu for some value of mu, okay, which initially might be large. And now what you want to do is in each step, you want to kind of use this sol uh, solution that you have as a world start and get a solution for, uh, you know, for the pro problem LP mu prime, where mu prime is just slightly smaller than the mu that you currently have. Okay? So essentially you just would like to go from optimal solution for mu to an optimal solution to mu prime being one minus delta times mu. Okay? And clearly once you develop this procedure, you can just iterate it and in the end shrink the value of mu to be as small as you want it. Okay? So that's what you do. Of course, you know, the qu key question here is, you know, how do you actually execute this step? So how do you go from optimal solution for uh, x mu, uh, x mu uh, from, for, for LP mu to an optimal solution for LP mu prime? And again, whenever you are in continuous optimization, the answer is always one. It's gradient descent, but this time it's actually gradient descent on steroids, which is called Newton, something that is known as Newton's method. Okay, so which is you can just view about a variant of gradient descent in which you don't approximate your function just by a linear term, but you actually also use the quadratic term as well. But in the end, you know, the thinking is exactly the same. It's just that that's the only thing that changes. Okay, so. So what's really happening? So this is the algorithm, but like what's really happening geometrically? So you know, imagine that this is our kind of you know feasible region over here. Okay, that's what we where we want to optimize, and our cost vector is going in this direction, which means that the optimum will be here. So this is the point that we actually want to compute. Now, what's happening to understand what interior points are doing is to look at something called central path, which is just the curve in this feasible space that you get by looking at optimum solutions for LP mu for all the values of mu, okay, from you know, uh, approaching zero to all the way to infinity. So what you will realize there is that essentially like, this curve is just a path in this feasible space of this, of this uh, linear program, which starts at something called analytic center of this feasible region. And then as, you, as mu gets smaller and smaller and smaller, this curve goes you know, towards, you know, towards the optimum solution. And essentially all that we are doing in the interpolation methods is just we are trying to discreetly kind of follow this curve. So we start you know, somewhere here, we find our first improvement step, and then essentially we just try to kind of, you know, discretize this dynamical system that we get here to get to the optimum. And that's exactly what's happening in the program. That's how you solve linear programs. Okay? So that's great. So that's how interior programs look like. But no, let's go back to maximum flow problem. Okay, so how do we use it to solve maximum flow? Well, it's actually very easy because it's not hard to cast a maximum flow as a linear program. You can easily encode it. And then now you have a linear program, you can just apply interior parameter to it, be done. And indeed, you will be done, except again, the question will be, what is the running time? And traditionally people thought that, and you know, definitely traditional methods definitely were very slow. The reason why they were slow was that, you know, each of these steps, actually like this Newton's method, it actually, when you do the second order approximation of your function, it's actually much more expensive and you need to solve a linear system. And in general, this is very expensive. However, uh, Deitch and Spielman noticed that I when you're actually trying to solve a specific uh, linear program, namely the maximum flow uh, LP formulation, then actually then, uh, uh, well, actually then, uh, these linear systems are very special. They're actually Laplacian linear systems, and you can use the fast solver to solve them fast. And when you just notice that, you will get, you will get, you will get the, again, this notorious n to, the three half, n to the three halves running time. So you will reconstruct what we knew how to do in combinatorial world by just you know, applying this, uh, linear pr uh, this interior point method with Laplacian solver to it. But you know, how can you go beyond that? Well, the problem is that going beyond that is actually quite difficult because essentially the reason why we again have this kind of overhead of square root of n 
is that you know there is uh, you know like there is this kind of this, this like square root of n is roughly how many iterations we need for this uh, dynamical system, this discretization of the dynamical system to converge to a close opti close to optimal solution. And as you can imagine, you know, trying to understand, you know, if this is the best possible convergence you can get is uh, like a very central problem in mathematical programming. In particular, this is just like the, the square root of m bound is due to Renegar. Uh, he, he proved it in the 80s. And since then, people tried to improve it, and they, they could not. Okay? And somehow this is very frustrating, because actually in practice, if you run these dynamical systems, you can usually converge after like 10 iterations or maybe 30 iterations. Still, theoretically, we cannot prove anything better than square root of m. So, no, so that's the barrier over here. So it looks like at the end. However, essentially, like the insight that you know, uh, my earlier work did is actually there is something that you can still do here. So essentially, like, once you don't think about trying to improve this convergence for an arbitrary LP, but you actually look at the maximum flow problem, specifically maximum flow problem for unit capacities, you actually can improve over this bound of Renegar. And you, know, you can get this improved running time of n to the 10 over 7. You know, 10 over 7 doesn't matter, except what matters is that it's better than 3 over half. Like essentially, it just shows that we did something new. And essentially, you can get a, like a better convergence bound for, the, for this interior method if you, know, if you know that your problem you are solving is a maximum flow problem. In fact, there is something more than that. What you can actually solve is that you can solve any, uh, any linear program faster, except the, you know, except the, uh, like the problem I will end up solving, uh, like essentially, like the problem for which I will give you a solution will be a perturbed version of your original problem. So you know, in general, this will be a meaningless statement. But for uh, unit capacity max flow, it actually means something. And you actually get a better algorithm out of this. OK? And I also want to mo notice that like, uh, later on, uh, Lee and Sid, for they actually also like, use similar methodology, but push it in a different direction. They essentially you know, used, uh, I, will not, I will not have time to mention why, but they used something called like, Smooth and Jones ellipsoid to also get a better dependence on uh, on n versus m. So essentially, they are able to get, like for sparse graphs, this is still n to the 3 halves running time. But for dense graphs, essentially, the overhead is only square root of n as opposed to square root of m. And there is some like very interesting stuff happening. And again, I don't have time to really go into this here. But I want to say that this thinking about the convergence of the method is actually very nice math there. So there is like dynamical systems on, on, on one side, and there's geometry on the other side. And there's like very nice interplay there. And I'm happy to talk with you after the talk to tell you a little bit more uh, you know, what's happening there. I think there are some very interesting questions there. But yeah, but this is how we get the progress. So you know, just one point before I conclude I wanted to make is something you know, a bit broader about like, what I referred at the beginning of the talk, that somehow the algorithms that we are getting from continuous optimization seem very different to the algorithms that we traditionally used. So you know, the classical algorithm like, for max flow augmenting path, they are like, purely combinatorial. They think about paths. They feel about edges and about cuts. They are like, greedy and they are very simple. And they are kind of, you could say, natural. Well, you know, the things that you get out of the interpolate methods, you know, it looks like, you know, it relies on the continuous, uh, continuous optimization linear algebra. It's also greedy, but in a very sophisticated way. And, you know, you would say it's not simple, and you would say it's not natural. So you would say that there is this dichotomy, you know, that there is like either the world on the left or like choose your poison. Like it's, it's world on the left or world on the left, right? However, I don't really think that this polarized view is justified. In particular, what I showed in a recent work is that actually these two worlds are closer to each other than you think. So in particular, what I showed is that you can actually get exactly the same speed up that you get through this method purely in the augmenting path framework. You just have to use some certain insi uh, like insights from coming from this domain. Just essentially, there is some potential function that uh, kind of is a bit magical, but it is exactly coming from the interpolate method. And essentially, like this potential function, once you have it in place, you can do the whole analysis in the context of augmenting path framework. Like you can essentially, like everything can fit the, uh, the old approaches. And it, so it, what's even more interesting is actually what happens is that this potential can be seen as a generalization of the potential that Goldberg Rao used in their, like the, the previous best classic algorithm for max flow. So you can, so maybe this is not a different way of doing algorithms, this is a kind of a more sophisticated way of doing the old, uh, the old algorithms here. Okay. So I just also want to say that, yes, out here I talk about maximum flow, but actually there is a bunch of other problems, like starting from other graph problems to uh, problems in scientific computing and problems even in online optimization, that actually all of them, you know, we recently managed, managed to make progress by exactly applying this kind of continuous optimization view on them. So, you know, it's 
At first, if you think about shortest path, you would not think that the continuous optimization view is the right one, but actually it turns out to be the case. Essentially, like you can use this view to actually get, you know, improve over like decades old, decades old uh, running time bounds by just viewing everything to the angle of continuous optimization. So this is not just max flow is not a only example where this happens. And you know, let me just now conclude. So somehow, I guess the point I'm trying to make in this talk is that continuous optimization or like gradient descent is kind of this new lens on like graph algorithms and algorithms in general that seems to be really powerful. So it managed, uh, it enabled us to make progress on a, like a broad set of very fundamental questions. And what is really important about it, and I really like this feature, is that kind of it's kind of principled and robust. Like the general method is obvious. Like you sort of. You know, if you have to say two sentences what you do, it's obvious what you do. The art goes in just like making sure that like, you know, everything is, you know, kind of like all the, the geometry that underlines it is, is aligned correctly. But, you know, you can like, you can either use it off the box or you can just then play with it a little bit more if you want to get the optimal running time. But, you know, the algorithm makes sense even when you just get it out of the box. So that's, I think, a very nice feature. And as I said, it also often ends up generalizing and explaining the previous classic work. Essentially, like we rediscover all the algorithms as a simple variant of what the continuous optimization version gives us. So you know, the question is, how does it change the landscape of algorithms? In particular, is it possible that kind of, you know, we, uh, Virginia Williams will talk about, uh, and uh, will talk about this, you know, problems that are, seem to be inherently hard, but you know, from what I work, find in my work is that problems are inherently easy because you can apply them to continuous optimization, uh, continuous optimization to them and then get very fast algorithms. So the question is like maybe there is some dichotomy between like the problems that Virginia studies and the problems that I study and maybe you can actually make it formal in some way. I'm not sure if you can do it but definitely thinking about this could be useful. And finally what I want to say is that essentially what is also nice about this connection is actually if you never knew anything about continuous optimization Thinking about this maximum flow uh, problem through this lens of it actually is a great way to understand continuous optimization itself. So, in particular, uh, uh, like after we, uh, like after this max flow work happened, actually we also managed to make progress on some core continuous optimization uh, questions because, kind of, seeing how the ideas from continuous optimization kind of project on the space of maximum flows give us better understanding of the limitations of the toolkit and things that could be improved there, and then we can just transplant back this, uh, this, uh, this, you know, this understanding back to continuous optimization work and actually make improvements there. Like without, there is like no maximum flow uh, there. It's just like you get improvements over long-standing bounds in continuous optimization as well. So uh, if you want to, to hear more about this connection, just read my survey that is in the ICM proceeding. I try to you know, give you a feel of like, how you can essentially derive all of the continuous optimization with an intent of uh, solving the maximum flow problem. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker. <laughs> so we have some time for questions. Or comments? <laughs> you may agree that. Uh, yes. You may probably agree that the final test of an algorithm is not its analysis, but its implementation. Yes. Uh, can you report on uh, yes. uh, so success so in real life for large scale? Yes. So uh, essentially, that's a great question, and that's definitely I agree with that. So. But you know, also as you know, so so like in sense, these algorithms are definitely like of the box are not insanely slow. They actually are reasonable. The problem though is that the max flow algorithms are extremely optimized. Uh, so uh, like Dan Spivan actually currently is working on libraries that are going to implement all of these primitives in an efficient way. And for max flow, I don't think we will beat in practice, you know, the existing, uh, you know, existing algorithms because they are exactly like, you know, essentially most of the graphs that we see in the real world seem to be easy for these algorithms, even though we know the worst case complexity is very bad. But there are like problems like a bit more general problems, like multi commodity flow problems for which the classic algorithms are actually not that great. And this method, they almost like, they almost don't care. Like essentially they're general enough that they can also transplant to like maximum, uh, maximum flow, uh, maxi uh, multi commodity flow setting as well. And there, there is a hope that we will soon uh, like over kind of, we get more m better algorithms in practice for that problems as well. But yeah, it's still like, you know, we developed the theory first. Now we are working on actual good engineering to essentially to, to get this like good implementation, but it looks, it looks promising. Any other question? Yes. Uh, it's better if you speak in the microphone. Uh, 
so, so do you have a conjecture uh, which uh, problem, uh, which other problem could be amenable to uh, this uh, more continuous approach? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I, like, okay, so as I already mentioned that anything like, like, okay, I think the rule of thumb is if you can find the compact, compact LP formulation of your problem, you are in business. Like, essentially, if you can find an LP formulation that is like linear in the head side of your graph, well, just come to talk to me. Uh, I think we for sure will do something. So that's one heuristic. But yeah, somehow what I find very interesting recently is that actually I'm looking into new domains and try to see where this kind of continuous optimization le lens could be applied. So one of the recent ones is the online algorithms. You know, at first, like all the algorithms there were very discrete. Like, the, the, you know, the, that's how you thought about uh, uh, online algorithms. Now, for case ever, which is like the central problem there, we have a clear continuous optimization uh, view on, the, on that. So that's the recent one. Uh, and you know, now once we showed how, to, how it can be done, I think this can be translated to other online problems as well. There is a new w one new domain, but we're still working on, like, we, we still are, like, we essentially, we, like, this is a domain that is very combinatorial. We have a continuous approach that reco recovers state of the art. We still cannot push beyond the state of the art, so we want to wait until we do that, so then we will, I will tell you uh, what happens. Any other question? So I have one. You mentioned in the beginning that the classical year, 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 era was based on the uh, discrete approach, yeah. and the modern based on the continuous. Yeah. Maybe the postmodern year will be based on the combination of both. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, so, so that's a great. Like, yeah, I, I think, uh, like, it's like I don't really think of them as different. Like as I said, like in the end, to my surprise, I discovered that essentially this what you get out of the continuous algorithm is something that makes complete sense in the discrete world. Just the potentials are a bit more sophisticated, and you would not probably f come up with them just you know out of the hat. So I think there will be some merge. Like definitely, you need fast data structures to make these continuous algorithms fast. So there is definitely a merge between discrete and continuous, and I think just it will stay like that. Like I think you will just think about some concrete primitives that you can implement fast because of the data structure, and then use them as a kind of as a building blocks for these continuous approaches somehow. Because continuous approaches are a good way to think about landscape of problems, but in the end, when you want to do, do get some very specific piece very fast, sometimes just and you can like reuse it. So Laplace and solvers, for instance, like you reuse it in many different places. So actual algorithm is very slick. So that's where you invest more of the combinatorial uh, insights there. Okay, thanks again for the speaker. Yeah.